Good, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to present. It's not just my view. It's, uh, this is a talk that has been prepared with uh, Vanessa Lea, who is uh, coordinating the uh, Réseau des Zones Ateliers Research Infrastructure with, with me and with the whole uh, coordination, coordination team of the, of the network. This talk is, uh, is more, it's not what we should do. It's more to introduce and to stimulate some discussion about this idea of moving from just observing to observing transformation and not just ongoing transformations, but transformations that we might want to stimulate. And this is a matter of debate. So um, in, this, in this talk, I, it will have three main parts. In the first part, I would like to come back to the why, why we need, so transformation, it, this will be very fast, but why also we need to, to co-construct and why it is so important for many aspects that we co-construct with the stakeholders and that we get some closer work with policymakers, which we don't know really how to do that properly. Then I will sh try to show how we do that in, this, in our network. And then I will end in the last third about what this means in t and we'll come back to institutions uh, and uh, also the last points that Daniel yesterday was talking about institutional change and what it means especially for the research institutions uh, if we go in that di direction. So transformation, you all know this graph. In the last century, the increasing CO2 concentrations have been rising and rising. And the only times in history when they have uh, displayed some decrease was during the uh, major world wars or a major economic crisis. Or more recently, of course, with the, uh, the pandemia. And you see here the pandemia put us on the right track, but it's not really a desirable track. Uh, so the, the, the main question to me is, uh, will we be able to reverse this trend voluntarily? And I'm adding here peacefully, because of course we all know that it's been already 15 years that the IPCC, it's the Nobel Prize that they received with Al Gore, and this has meaning. So the idea here is that, uh, we talk a lot about adaptation, right? Adaptation, of course adaptation will be necessary in this, the, the last report of the IPCC, the group two, has demonstrated all the importance that adaptation will have to, to prevent, uh, not to prevent, but to cope with some kind of, uh, of major risk. But adaptation will not be enough because we know that we, do, we are not equal regarding adaptation in different parts of the world and that at some point with increasing amplitude and frequencies of shocks, that at some point, I mean, adaptation will not be enough. So if we have to move to, to something else. And I like also this sentence and this quote by Cynthia Fleury uh, in her book, which is The End of Courage. She's telling us that adaptation strategies are inevitable and signs of maturity. So I was explaining it, they, they are expected. But they are also, unfortunately, the surest way to the acceptance and legitimization of the unacceptable. And I think this is something, I will come back on that, to the why we need to go beyond adaptation and that we need a, a new great transformation uh, to take place. And then we'll talk, of course, about the role of research in, in that. I would like to cite you this book by uh, Eric Oling Wright. He has produced a social theory of transformation. It's a very nice uh, book. I think the title in English is Envisioning Real Utopias. And uh, what he's telling us first is that we have to think that this transformation is possible. You know, so we have to go much beyond uh, this idea of catastrophe and collapsology and so on because this is probably not how we can engage people in trying to go to this transformation. So th let's remain the future open. And then he's producing and proposing three kinds of discussion which uh, brings us back to the discussion we had yesterday whether you know, more radical compared to a softer uh, revolution, say. So he's, well, revolution is what he calls the radical transformation. There are these interstitial transformations which take place in margins, right? But for the moment, we, and we know there are thousands and there are millions of initiatives at the local scale, but for the moment they don't, you know, they don't change the track of the boat that, uh, uh, Philip was, was, talking, uh, was talking about. And then he's talking about this symbiotic transformation. So it starts in these margins, but then it involves the institutions so that you upscale and then you have maybe chances to, 
to change, uh, to change the system. And what I'm adding to that is that what is very important to me is that we have to make it also desirable. And uh, as long as we don't do that, we'll not be able to bring, to, to, to bring people on, on the boat. And to make it desirable, to me, it's very important to link different so-called crises. Uh, I say so-called crises because we all know they aren't crises. You know crises? You have the idea that you're in a crisis and then you can get out of it in a couple of years or something like that. Now we're more in a system which is uh, forgetting a lot of things, forgetting the limitary and the planetary boundaries. We all know about them, climate change, biodiversity loss, and, uh, and so on. And also a system which is forgetting uh, the human aspect of, uh, say, development, right? So some people call that the anthropological crisis. So there is this loss of a common world, and I'll come back to that because against that, the idea of co-construction is very is very important. We'll talk about it. Marchandization of humans that I illustrated here, the loss of a common world, I illustrated it with these increasing uh, inequalities. And we have a philosopher in France, Lucien Save, he's talking about this uncontrollable uh, fading of meaning. And to me, the idea of bringing together this is not to add on uh, our depression, you understand this, it's more the idea that by combining them, you can try to produce another story. Well, this is something I, I, I tried two years ago, showing that how it is important to link scales, the global, the local scale, and probably the intimate scale as well, but also combining the thinking with the action. And, um, well, and, so the, and, and, and then the past also and the, and the present. And for the past is the, this idea of climate debt. I will not enter it at all today about acting global. And we'll focus on the rethinking the local. And of course, rethinking the local, I think it's difficult not to talk, and it's a pleasure even to talk about Bruno Latour. You know, he passed away uh, two or three weeks ago, and he wrote this book on where to land. And it's a very interesting book with regard to what I'm trying to, uh, to the story I'm trying to, to tell here. You have this graph, and I just want to take a minute to explain it. You have what he called attractors, so you have the number one, and the number two is the global. So you had in the past this idea of globalization and uh, with the many good things that it brought, but also the many, say, bad things about what I was telling you in terms of environmental degradations, the rise of inequalities, and, and so on. And we all know that, that it's not possible. So everybody is thinking about relocalization. But there is this attractor number four on top, say, Donald Trump or these, all these populisms which are increasing everywhere on the planet. And then Bruno Latour was suggesting that we should move to the attractor number three, what he called the terrestrial. So relocalization is not a local which is closed to on itself, but is more a local open to the world. And then he's talking about the importance of the interactions between different actors and how to make politics, everyday politics, on territories. And this is something that, to me, is very important. The problem is that, for the moment, we are still stuck in, in this, what uh, Nancy Fraser, in an other very interesting book, which is called Regression Ages, is calling a non-choice between either we adapt to globalization or we move to pop populism, which is actually, in France, this is the choice we had in the last two elections. And uh, it's not proposing a project of a major change, of a major transformation. And to me, the, well, everybody is asking himself, why? Why is it that we all know that we are going to hit the wall, but still the boat is continuing? And maybe a major problem also comes from this idea of wicked problems. Because the, the different so-called crises I was uh, showing to you, there are typical examples of these wicked problems. So those wicked problems, they are complex, they are systemic, they are urgent, they are full of uncertainty, there, are, uh, there is no simple to the solution to them, just for the construction of a, a European research infrastructure. Uh, and even the solutions may even generate some more problems. And what is most important is that all those problems are very strongly interconnected. And they will be more and more interconnected in the coming years between climate change and inequalities, north-south divide, for example, but also in every region, increasing rise of inequalities uh, linked to climate change. For example, this is just one example. And the problem is that, first we refuse this complexity, this systemic complexity, I'll come back to that, and also we refuse limits. 
So we refuse those planetary limits. And I think we also refuse uh, the limit to our power. You know, in, I, I don't know if there's this hubris term in English. You know, the, this idea of uh, la toute puissance. I don't know how to say that. Uh, the, the, the human power, you know, uh, like uh, climate geoengineering or this idea of uh, uh, intelligence artificial and that you can expand to transhumanism and so on. So many people are thinking that, as we always did, technology will save us. And uh, so they think that this is the solution. And then we also forget that there is no simple solution to these complex problems. So in these days, our public space is completely saturated with uh, very, I mean, with Simplification, let's say. Uh, mostly economic discourse and, I said, uh, identity-based discourses. And for many, uh, and I, I like very much this book called Governs by Numbers by uh, Alain Supio. And um, he's saying that uh, actually we have abandoned the decision, for example, uh, building institutions that would help societies to take the major decisions that need to be taken. We have abandoned that to what we call a system. You know, we always talk about the system, but who is the system? So he's talking about numbers, excessive rationalization, this governance by, by numbers. Some people are talking about the machine and so on. And this reminds me of this sentence by T.S. Eliot it's almost a century ago. And he was already asking, where is the wisdom, so in terms of decision, for example, that we have lost in information, in knowledge, and where is the knowledge that we have lost in information? And François Tadei, uh, who published this book uh, four or five years ago about teaching, because all this has very important implications for teaching, uh, he, he was asking, where is the information that we have lost in data? And this governance by numbers, Alain Supio is showing us that it creates this very big so-called malaise in civilization. This... Uh, uh, what Lucien Seva was describing was talking to us about this uncontrollable fading of, of meaning. So in addition to this governance by numbers, there is this, I mentioned it already, this loss of a common word that Anna Arendt uh, has done a lot of work on that already, and that is increasing in the last decades. The increasing rise of inequalities, we all know that. The decay of the collective with the disappearance of... Uh, um, Trade unions, political parties are replaced by movements behind one person, you know, and the very dangerous things that you can see with this. And more and more, the polarization of society. And we see that in many societies and with the democracy being really uh, challenged, I would, uh, I would say. And especially with, for example, the increasing the rise of the social networks, but it's not the only, the only reason. And actually, what is very important is that... Uh, this fading of meaning, it, it takes place even, uh, for example, there is, a, there is an, a, a collective which has been created a few years ago called in France, No Service Public. Uh, so that they show, and they have made a big survey, and with about 4,000 respondents, that 80% of the people working in public services, so research, but also education, um, uh, transport, and, uh, and care, 80% of the people are losing meaning. And I will come back at the end of the talk if I have time talking about Labo 1.5, where we try to think about reducing the carbon emission of the research itself. But we see that every day in the labs, this, this uh, problem of, uh, of meaning. So the idea, and if I'm saying that, is that today what I think is very important is that we need to bring back some more collective thinking, to bring back meaning in all what we are doing, and to bring back uh, the common. And this is why um, what we try, and I'm arriving now to the research and what we do to, combat, to fight against these things, maybe is ask the question, how we come back from the data to this wisdom through information and knowledge. So it's not saying that data are not important, that long-term observations and so on are not important, but always asking the question why we measure this and how this will be usable uh, by the, the policymaker to, to take more uh, wise decisions. And to me, this is something very important also, is uh, what Roland Gori is, is telling us here, is that it is through work and professions that a quiet but anthropologically indispensable revolution will take place. 
And I think that if we want to get out from the margins, and I'm not saying that what the margins are doing is not important, um, what I want to show you here is that it is through work that maybe the upscaling can, can take place. And of course this has questions and implications for the way we conduct research. So to come back and to bring more common, what we try to do in the, and this is now I'm arriving to this, uh, to our research infrastructure, uh, I want to show you that co-construction is maybe one very important, it's not saying that it will save everything, and that's not at all, but at least it's one way to try to bring this common and the meaning and, uh, and maybe more democracy on what we are what, do, what we are doing. So for example, starting with the data, the data will be co-constructed. And, uh, and we'll see that we'll have to go much beyond numbers. Uh, talking about information, the, the idea is not just to inform people and you know, transfer knowledge, but the idea is to involve people in the co-construction of knowledge. So people will not be just receptors and will receive information from scientists and others. They will contribute to create value and a new kind of value on territories uh, by participating in the co-construction. And even in co-construction of data on some very controversial uh, um, aspects. For us in Britain it can be nitrate, for other people it can be uh, whatever the, the bear in the Pyrenees or the wolf in the, in the Alps. They are all boundary controversial objects which allow us to sit around the table and try to discuss about what to do with this, uh, this problem. So this is this idea of uh, bringing meaning into knowledge, so this is not this cannot be <laughs> translated, it's this idea that knowledge in France means connaissance and this is this rising of, uh, of meaning. And then asking questions at the interface, at the science policy interface. Again debating, and we had this question I think yesterday also, uh, should we just stay as scientists, do a measurement 3.1 plus or minus 0.5, uh, and then we give that to decision makers and they do whatever they want, or we want to be more engaged with stakeholders with policymakers. This is all the all a matter of, uh, of debate. So what we try to do in, the, in our research infrastructure, Réseau des Zones Ateliers, is exactly this co-construction. So Réseau des Ateliers, you, you, you know maybe, so there are geographical areas, they are focused on a, so mostly at regional scale around a functional unit. So we have, you see here, 13 or 14 zone Ateliers on the French uh, territory well, metropolitan territory, and then we have one in Antarctica and another one in Zimbabwe, in a regional natural park. And uh, so in France, we have three around big rivers. We have uh, them around uh, mountains. We have one or two on cities, on agricultural plains, or along the land ocean continuum. So the zone atelier, they are, and they aim to explore the functioning and the trajectories, past and future, of what we call those social ecological systems. So you have a representation of these systems here. It's not a closed system, it's open to external fluxes, energy of course, but also the global market, the global, global change of course. And then you have this uh, social ecological ecosystem that you have seen already yesterday several uh, representations. So to try to reconnect the social component, let's say, and the ecosystem. We are fighting again against uh, two centuries of uh, strong separation between the two. Of course, we need to engage into wide, wide interdisciplinarity, especially between the fields of human and social sciences on one hand and uh, natural sciences on the other hand. And then we need to engage with stakeholders for this co-construction of knowledge. And I would say, with respect to what I was saying earlier in the talk, this is probably the first service that we, that we aim at offering in our research infrastructure and which is difficult to evaluate, but it's this co-construction of knowledge and all the impact it may have in terms of uh, reinforcing capacities and the power to act for different kind of actors on, on the territories. So what does it mean for us? If you look at this typical triangle uh, combining observation, experimentation, and modeling. In our network, observation, it's not only the ecosystem, but it's the social ecological system. And then we try to have more and more uh, citizen science program, which may take very different, uh, very different forms. Experimentation, and I'll come back to that also later, they are, and they can be, 
social ecological experiments. And this is where transformation is entering the game. The idea here is to work with stakeholders and stimulate some changing practices. It can be with uh, farmers on watersheds or with fishermen and, or whoever. And then we want to follow year after year, and this is where the idea of observing transformation is, uh, is entering the game. Year after year, you want to explore the impacts of this transformation on the environment, but then also on the social and economical components of society, but also on politics and maybe on, uh, on the law in the establishment, maybe of new, of new norms. The modeling, well, the models can be uh, constructed with different partners. Uh, the scenarios will need to be co-constructed, and this is where the idea of desirable transformation is entering the game also. And then this modeling can go up to uh, companion modeling to provide some help for decision making. And decision making, I'm talking at individual scales, and this is where uh, this idea of, again, co-construction and this service that we offer is try to reinforce the capacities of different kind of actors, reinforce their, uh, their power to act, and this can be at individual scale, but this also, and maybe most importantly, can be also at the social scales in terms of collective action, and then uh, hopefully we have, and then it will have to be studied more deeply uh, what kind of impact these approaches will have on public policies regarding transformation to more uh, sustainability. Just one example, uh, it's in our Brittany region. It's a, a mix of the two uh, zone atelier brest and zone atelier in Brest and then the zone atelier uh, Armorique in Rennes. So this is an example along the land ocean continuum. Here the problematic you know, is um, agro-industrial uh, model in Brittany, very intensive uh, farming many, many pigs, and uh, producing a lot of nitrate, and then green tides, and many problems uh, for tourism, many problems also for fisheries, uh, and so on. And we are stuck in this problem in Brittany for like 30 years or something like that. Um, and so what we, try, what we would like to try to illustrate this approach is, for example, we are conducting uh, social ecological experiments on one hand with farmers and on the other hand with some uh, people and conchili um, culture. Uh, I don't know what would be the English term about that. Uh, we have some land ocean modeling, so it's the idea of studying the, the, the cascade of impacts of both climate change and changing practices on the watershed all along the land ocean continuum, so looking at water quality and biodiversity from the uh, upper stream to the coastal zone. And then the modeling, and then the observation is long-term observations. So we are using our observatories in Rennes and in Brest, but we want to add to that uh, some surveys with uh, social sciences. Uh, within the Terraforma project, we want to, fo to have this uh, focus on, uh, on low-tech, and of course many, pro many programs with the uh, citizen sciences. So the idea with this approach is to try to, to, to co-construct new indicators better able to describe the complexity of the social ecological system uh, in these different uh, components. So here we are going to the third part, in, in, moving in terms uh, of institution, what it means for institutions. I think that for the moment our observatories that have been designed to observe, mostly first the ecosystems, we try to have more and better observation of the social ecological system. And now the idea would be, and but this is to be discussed, and there will be in the workshop this afternoon, one of the table will be dedicated to, to that and to the advantage of doing that, or, or, or the breaks, why we should not do that maybe, and this is completely open to, to discussion. So observation, first, of course, strongly needed. Uh, first, describe the territory, and here I... I cite again a book by Bruno Latour and uh, his uh, survey on our different existing modes. So this very important aspect of describing ourselves on territories, our relations among humans, our relations with nature. And uh, of course, uh, we can have the help of surveys, we can have the help of uh, experience knowledge. So this is when we want to hybridize the scientific knowledge with the knowledge by different stakeholders on the territories. We can be also, we can receive the help of artists. 
And especially if we want, for example, to think in terms of desirable transformation, and the second line here in terms of defining our uh, wishes list here, defining collectively desirable tra trajectories, not only producing scenarios about what will probably happen, right, but more bringing people together to on territories, work together to define what we want our territory to be in 10, 20 or, or, or 50 years. So the idea here is that we go beyond ecosystems, so we want to, to observe long-term uh, changes on social ecological systems, and then beyond numbers is try to bring together with numbers, so surveys by social scientists, but also uh, this idea of storytelling, trying to, to invent some new stories for each territory about where we want to, to go. Again, bringing back meaning of what it means developing our territory, what does it mean for us as an individual, but also as a, as a species in relation to our, the, the non-humans here. So what is very important when you want to, go, to move to, tra to transformation and to those social ecological experiments, I'm just citing this book by John Dewey here. John Dewey is this American philosopher, pragmatist, and he wrote some very nice things a, a century ago at this interface between uh, democracy, education, and experience. And for him, we do not learn from experience, we learn from reflecting on experience. And the experience is really an experimentation. So this is the, the, the kind of thing that I was talking to you about, um, uh, these social ecological experiments, right? Trying to stimulate transformation. And then the question is why, why is it interesting to do that at the scale of a network? Because we can try to do that uh, on one particular side, but it's very interesting to do that at the network scale. And for example, in, the, in our network, we want to use the great diversity of functional units and the great diversity of the context, uh, because this provides us numerous opportunities to conduct original transdisciplinary research. And we can take comparative approaches, but maybe most importantly also, we can try to test some hypotheses along different kinds of gradients. And this gradient, they can be climatic, they can be uh, different um, anthropo uh, anthropogenic impacts. Uh, I quoted here also the history of co-construction. It's not the same, and it will be very interesting for us to look in terms of policy impact. It's not the same if the Zone Atelier has been created last year, and people are just trying to engage with stakeholders, compared to other Zone Atelier, like the one yesterday Laurence has shown us in the Seine River, where they exist as a zone atelier, but they were existing and doing these things before being named zone atelier for like 40 years. And so they have a strong experience and how it's also very important within a network to see how we can benefit from the expertise of other uh, zone ateliers. But testing this hypothesis along gradients can be something very interesting. And of course, because we are talking about LTA and this will be also discussed in the afternoon during the workshop. You know that within Elter, um, Philippe and Jérôme, they have shown you this morning where we, want to, where we want to go. We contribute together to the French contribution to this Elter. But then with this idea of observatories of transformations, so what we need to discuss, and that what we discussed during this dinner that Michael yesterday morning uh, described that a little bit, there are these standard observations but we know that we have to go beyond that. And so it's how to combine these standard observations with what he was calling, I think, customized observations, so more specific to a given site and, uh, and going well beyond just statistics on demography or land, land use change and so on. So strong expertise, strong scientific expertise, but hybridization with uh, local knowledge, very, very important. So studying and observing ongoing transformations, but also stimulating transformation. And I think this brings me back to what Philippe was saying in terms of you know, the, his arrow from the research to the infrastructure in terms of design. And this is where we are at this stage, I think. And this is why I insisted on the why we want to do all this, is that this should have strong impact on the way we design the infrastructure. And the discussion this afternoon should bring us to, to this because in terms of selecting sites, for example, it should depend on the scientific question, on the kind of gradient you want to study, the kind of comparative approach you want to, to undertake. It will depend also on societal problems, and there may be some societal problems which are quite similar in Finland, in Spain, in, and in Austria. 
And, uh, and what I believe is that it's very interesting also to bring in the ethical dimension because we are in different cultural contexts and different economic contexts and there are many ethical questions about these collaborations which need to be put on the table before we start this, uh, these things. Okay, so I would like just to end in the last five minutes, if I, if I may, I'm maybe longer, <laughs> okay, uh, about what, what, this, what implication this has in terms of institutional change for, um, for our research community. Because this idea of you know, interdisciplinarity, uh, working with stakeholders, the basic thing is that it takes time. It's a huge uh, time demanding, so you also need, because you need to, to step aside, you need to get out from your comfort zone. So if you start to work, I'm a biogeochemist, and if I start to work with a political scientist or a sociologist, I will not publish 10 papers a year in the field of biogeochemistry. And uh, this is a major uh, constraint for us, uh, this time-consuming approach. And I, I really want to, to insist in this, uh, in this slide on, on this paper, which was published three years ago by two researchers from the Stockholm Resilience Center. It's just called Unsustainable Science. And, um, you know, science is, is as all aspects, all other uh, aspects of human activities, we are subject, and uh, if not, you tell me, uh, by this governance, by numbers, increasing bureaucracy, and marchandization, and most importantly, to this uh, acceleration. You know, this, there's this book by, I re strongly recommend by this uh, German sociologist, Armut Rosa. He has described acceleration and all its impact, especially in terms of alienation at different scales. So, acceleration of technological developments, social change, life rhythms. And he has also described the engine of acceleration and the cultural engine in terms of refusal of limits, technology development, and so on. And then the social engine of acceleration, which is competition. And we all know that research, we are in a very competitive, uh, in a very competitive system. For them, being in a competitive system like this means that we don't have the time to address all what I was talking to you in terms of co-construction of knowledge. So we, don't, we are not able to address the capacity. And if you, if you read the sentence in red here, Reaching a more sustainable Earth relies upon the scientific community to generate critical insights and solutions, but we fear that this will not happen to the extent or in the time needed unless science itself becomes more sustainable. So when they talk about sustainable, they don't talk about the CO2 emissions or the impact, environmental of impacts of science, and I wanted to talk about them because they are very important, but I don't think I, I have the time to do that. But they are talking about this acceleration and the fact that we lack uh, time to address complexity. Though. So they call for uh, the, the new evaluation metrics, right, to increase uh, the resilience of our community, uh, to increase our welfare as, uh, as scientists, but most importantly, to create these spaces for creativity. And this is where research first should start by uh, incarnate transformation. So it should, should transform itself first. And this is where we come back to this symbiotic transformation is that if we want more scientists to be engaged in the, the kind of approach that we try to have at the, and this whole scale approach, probably this has to go through uh, strong changes, not only in the funding and uh, the way science is being funded, but also the way science is being um, evaluated. I had a few, well, okay, so the, then I will finish with just this one. In terms of changes, for me, this is, I try to illustrate this through these two uh, knowledge triangle. You have the one on the left, which is the present uh, knowledge triangle on the left. So you have, um, you know, you have research, mostly disciplinary, you have education, which is mostly, uh, mostly descending, top-down, and then you have innovation, which is mostly uh, technological. And then you combine those, you produce knowledge for growth and for employment and so on, and this is the system we have. And on the right, so we just open space, we enrich this first triangle, but we open space for research to be more inter- and transdisciplinary, uh, for the education to be not only top-down, but uh, seen more as an attention, and then I took out innovation from this triangle and I replaced it by the, the participation of the researchers to the life, say, life of the city, right? 
And uh, this doesn't mean that innovation is disappearing, but innovation is not only technological, but it's also pedagogical, it's social, it has to be institutional, and I think it has to maybe to start by the changing the way we, 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 we fund and we evaluate our research activity. So I wanted to talk to you about uh, what impact this has, not what impact this has, but how we come to the same conclusion with another entry, which is the one when you start thinking about what research should do in terms of reducing, uh, and I go to just this, in terms of reducing its environmental impact. Uh, we are in the collective Labo 1.5 where we are designing an experiment to stimulate uh, strong emission, uh, CO2 emission reductions in labs with uh, different tools. They can be awareness raising tools, they can be uh, taxes or quotas in labs and so on. And we come back to the same conclusions. I mean, probably we have to change the, uh, those, uh, those criteria and include in the evaluation criteria of research some aspects on the sobriety of the research, but also on the quality of research, coming back to quality rather than quantity, collaboration rather than competition, and, and so on, the idea of art and science. Maybe also some aspects of uh, the quality of life at work, which is very important with what I, I leave you, well, I'll leave you with this, I'm, I'm afraid I... I'm too long. The idea here is just thinking that if we go to another more global indicator for the research activity, probably we are thinking about moving towards uh, what is called like slow science. Isabel Stengers wrote a book about that 10 years ago already, and I think this is very something that we have to think about if we want to move to this transformation and think about the role research can have in this transformation. So I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>